Welcome to Threshold Stories, crossing thresholds one story at a time. I'm your host, Jeff Gora. Podcast 107. I've been looking forward to this podcast for a while. Um, Today is November the 8th, um, and it's the release date of the final book in my trilogy. Um, This last book is called Of Healing and Finding Home. Um, I can't really talk about book three standalone without some of the uh, history of book one and book two. So book one as I've documented earlier, took um, several years to get out the door. Um, Most of that time was spent writing, but quite a big part of that act of creating this book and getting it out the door in two different formats was finding a publisher and finding somebody whom I could work with to help get the book out the door in a way that I liked. Um, I was certain I was going to write other books, so I had to have a conversation early on with the publisher about making sure that the books um, appeared consistent when they're on the shelf. So if you if you look at the back of book one, the back of book two, and the back of book three now, I wanted to make sure not only were the same size, but fonts, logos, layouts of my name and everything, that all looked the same so that as people bought them and accumulated them, um, they looked good next to each other. That was important to me. Um, when the third book was getting near the state of completion, I started going into a bit of denial that I had finally done it. Um, that kicks back to my eighth grade English teacher, Mrs. Parrott. I was, um, my, my father traveled a lot when I was younger, and I had a tendency in class to act out sometimes. Um, in, eighth, in eighth grade, specifically, English was the class I acted out, and they put me in, in a, um, I don't know, the honors class or the smart kids class um, for no other reason than they saw potential. Well, I didn't do anything with that. In fact, I didn't ever really like reading um, as a child growing up. Um, at any to any extent, even in eighth grade, I'd only had a couple of really good reading experiences. A lot of the stuff they assigned us, I never connected with. But Miss Parrot did a good job at publicly ridiculing me and sharing with everybody that I didn't have much talent and um, I should just worry about getting be done with this class and move on. Um, she thought she was polite in some instances, saying you probably have a strength with the sciences, which of course I did. Um, you know, I I went through and got a lot of degrees in science and spent a lot of my um, career teaching science to others. And I certainly understand the method, but I missed out on a lot of my writing career because of my experiences with Miss Parrott. I was tempted to um, uh, dedicate the book to her, but that seemed inappropriate. It's like, you know, dedicating a book to Hitler or something like that. Not that she was an evil person, but she certainly got in the way of my progress. Uh, That said, God did use her. I mean, I'm talking about her right now. And maybe I would have done the same thing if I was her, because if you had a class of 25 kids and one kid, namely me, was ruining it for everybody else, you would try to find things you could say or do to get him to shut up or get him to stop. And certainly all the other methods she used, meaning stop it, Jeffrey, putting me in a different signed seat, sending me to the principal's office, none of those were giving her the desired result. So she migrated to shame and that worked. You know, the public ridicule worked, and but it did slow me down some. Um. So book three, I tie together many of the issues that I left dangling in book two, but certainly not all of them. It's called Of Healing and Finding Home because our characters in uh, book two um, completed an epic journey of the sort that history will record, even though it's a fictional history. And they came home only to discover that they were different and home wasn't. And they had an issue associated with reconciling it. Um, They experienced scars from pleasure. So they went to the Roman Empire to the heart of the Roman Empire and were exposed to the worst parts of the Roman Empire, even though they were only there for a little while, because it mandated that they interact with the people in command of the empire um, in a social manner. And there was nothing about the training of being from a small village in a, in a he- small Hebrew village in the middle of occupied Judah that could prepare them for what they got to see. And this book is all about the healing that they had to go through associated with those experiences. Um, each one of my characters um, had to take a courageous step on something, even the secondary characters that I only introduced in passing in book two. And I don't tie together all the ends for every character in the book, but I do tie together what I think are the most important ones. And um, the very last scene of the book, I rewrote several times over because I wanted to try to come up with the best image I could that would portray to everybody um, how Christ can use all things for his glory. And so I took one of the worst moments in the first book and made something beautiful out of it in the end. And um, I loved writing that last chapter. In fact, when I finished it, 
I remember rewriting it only to end up saying, this is, this is, I can't improve on this. This is as good as it gets. So some questions that have come up, um, not only by editorial staff, um, but other people who have read it. Um, why did I conclude the trilogy with the same characters as book two? Well, book two was an action packed book. You know, there was a lot of traveling, a lot of um, introductions, uh, paragraphs, chapters that you could read standalone and say, wow, that was pretty interesting. I can't wait to see what's next. And um, there was a lot of monologue and story that I needed to put in there to finish what those action scenes did to the people, specifically what it did to their souls. Biblical characters. How did I pick which biblical characters I wanted to use? I call this Christian fiction because I take stories both from the Old and New Testament and I add to them. I'm not doing it in an add to them way to destroy the original meaning or put in something that wasn't there, but I feel it was very intentional by God to give us pieces of these of people's characters and just leave us hanging with what happened before and what happened after, just to allow us to speculate. So I picked Cornelius specifically to bring in both in book one and in book three a lot. Cornelius was um, a centurion in the town of Caesarea, and he was um, he was exposed to the gospel care of dreams and and Simon Peter coming to visit him. But Cornelius's role in history is quasi significant enough for me to talk about it for a minute or two here. So as a centurion, the word literally translates as um, leader of a hundred, therefore the word century. So a centurion had about a hundred people reporting up to him, but more importantly, a centurion was a magistrate of a community. So he was the one people would go to when there was a dispute, and he was the one who would administer justice. So he was not only the judge, but he was also the jury. And to a certain extent, he was also the police department because um, the people who helped enforce the laws also reported to him. So it would be a commonplace event for a centurion to not only hear a dispute, but if there was something that had happened and he had already perhaps cautioned somebody on it or had given some um, ruling on it or had placed something in the, in the local rules on how behavior is supposed to be governed, he might find himself actually performing the beheading himself or he might find himself doing the killing himself, make sure that it establishes his place in the community. And although there's no reference to Cornelius doing any of this in the New Testament, we knew that was part of his job description. Uh, the town of Caesarea is a coastal community, and it was one of the three largest coastal communities that the Roman Empire used for bringing people and goods in and out of Judah. Um, they spent a lot of money and time creating aqueducts and public roads and public works in and around Caesarea. And very likely, there was a lot of people going in and out of there, specifically migrant workers helping with the construction. Yes, there were slaves. But there were also an awful lot of paid construction, and many of that was many of those people were coming from other countries other than Judah. So Egyptians, Britons, Gauls, they probably were all imported into that region to do work, and many of them probably committed crimes while they were there, specifically if they were drinking. And it was probably Cornelius's job to administer punishment for a lot of those people who were coming through. Um, I thought it was fascinating that God chose to use that character as a bridgeway between a worldly power and a time when the new Christian church was fledgling and, and, and just starting its growth act. Um, the other character that I decided to use was the, um, uh, uh, the, the writer Luke. Uh, we know he was a healer. He was called a physician and a healer in the New Testament, yet we hear little of his efforts to heal anybody. And I decided that that deserved some imagination. And I decided that he was going to himself be injured and, and require some healing on his own. And I talk about that in the, in the first book quite a bit. Um, so those are the two characters I feel like I pulled in the most. There's references to a third, but it's just a reference. Um, so the ending had an injection of unbelievability to it in the second book. Well, considering that Titus had actually um, led the invasion of the destruction of Jerusalem and had probably seen fledgling Christians, probably had seen the new church when when they were just the followers of the way, personally with his own eyes when he was in uh, Jerusalem. Um, it's reasonable to think that he had thoughts of those people in that time when he became emperor 14 years later or 13 years later. I would imagine that there were probably some moments when all the prayers of the people at the time for leaders to become godly men and that the powers of the earth be replaced by the powers from heaven, that people prayed for Titus to become 
uh, a Christian and discard the ways of his family and not be a polytheist and a murderer and all that goes with it. So I thought it was really possible that somebody like Titus could actually become a Christian and it slipped through the cracks of history. Remember that time, it was commonplace for an emperor of Rome to rise to power and die within a year. It was commonplace. The Caesar the household of Caesar is a, a period of seven years when they have four different emperors. So I thought it was reasonable that Titus could, in fact, um, commit himself to Christ and then die literally days later. And adding that story to the book seemed to make natural sense and flow based on how Christ has always used young generations to influence old generations in the same way that old generations influence young generations. So that seemed natural to me to write, even though it might have come across as a little bit unbelievable to you. How did I pick the characters? Um, I don't know if I really picked the characters as much as I just sat in my own um, my own space. When, um, as a writer, you kind of are forced to come to peace with some of your own demons um, in order to create content that people can appreciate. Um, the power of a story is uh, exacerbated by an author, especially if most of the story is true. You know, um, and most of us have some pretty sad stories that have, we have lived that we probably never disclose the sum totality to any person, even though we perhaps think we have. But as that, as these layers of the story, the onion of the story get unpeeled, um, there's healing that occurs. Um, I have healed tremendously as a human being writing all these books. I mean, it's pretty well documented that 20 months ago, 21 months ago, I should have died in a, in, a, in a freak bicycle accident, but I didn't. And that I was able to create this trilogy after that is kind of part of my testimony that how God can use all things for beauty. So you might say, is there a book for it? No, there's no book for it. I have another book coming out a few months later called Letters to and from Eternity. That'll be a separate podcast. Um, but the book, this book three, the, this, this tale of these characters ends here. Um, I have certainly been tempted and I have already created an outline for another set of books that play off of some of the characters in this book. And I, put, I go from the first century into the second century. And I've certainly looked at the real timeline of the second century to see what I could do and where I would do it. And I have some wonderful ideas, but they're just ideas. I haven't put a single sentence to pen. Um, I am traveling. Um, I'm just actually, by the time you guys hear this, I'll have just come back from the Himalaya and I'll have spent um, over two weeks in one of my favorite places in the world. And I certainly will have had created a new book idea by then. And I anticipate writing several books in 2022 as well. So stay tuned. Thanks for um, participating in these, these, these um, podcasts about the books. Um, you can get the books on all the mainstream locations, uh, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, Target. <laughs> it's for sale on, <laughs> online in a couple of different places in Europe and Asia as well. Uh, the ebook seems to be the most popular one to download and use. Please don't buy online a place that says they're used because they're just released today. There are no used copies on planet Earth. <laughs> um, somebody is bootlegging my books and, and reprinting them um, to uh, shave corners and no one's making any money on that except the guy who's bootlegging my books. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening to this chapter of Threshold Stories, Crossing Thresholds, One Story at a Time. You're ready to cross more thresholds with me in two weeks. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. You can find me on LinkedIn or on my Facebook page at Jeff Gora Team USA.